way to the British Library. This journey comprises an exciting, but at the same time, disappointing chapter in our search for Richard. Well, we've come to the British Library today to view a document that's fascinated me for nearly three decades. Unfortunately, due to scheduling constraints, the library just couldn't agree to us to film the document. They offered us a later date, but uh, well, we'll be on the other side of the world by then, sadly. So uh, anyway, we've just found out too that that's relegated us to viewing only a microfilm version of the document, which is very disappointing. But uh, life is what it is, and we'll just have to make the best of it. Life uh, is difficult for the amateur filmmaker. Anyway, maybe in the sequel. So what is this amazing document that we've come halfway around the world to see? On April 9, 1483, Edward IV suddenly dies. He leaves behind his 12-year-old son as heir and his brother Richard as Lord Protector, ruler of the land until the boy king reaches adulthood. Elizabeth Woodville, now Queen Mother, hated Richard and saw him as a roadblock to establishing a Woodville dynasty on the throne. She sends urgent word to her brother Earl Rivers to hurry to London with the boy king so as to crown him before Richard could assume his role as protector. Richard knew what was going on though. Letters arrived urging him to secure the new king and hasten to London. Richard and Rivers agreed to join forces en route to London, allowing the young Edward V and his uncle Richard, the Lord Protector, to enter the capital together. And this is where they agreed to meet. Northampton was a good choice. It was a good sized market town and importantly, it was on the main road to London from both the west, from where the new king would come, and also from the north, from where Richard would come. And so on April 29, 1483, Richard, along with the Duke of Buckingham and their little band of followers, arrived in Northampton to join forces with their new sovereign, Edward V. But when they got here, Edward was nowhere to be seen. Richard was soon filled in. The king and his band had advanced 14 miles down the London road to Stony Stratford to lodge the night there. Soon Rivers appears riding back to meet Richard and Buckingham. He explains that the king vacated Northampton merely to make enough room for Richard and his men to find lodgings. Whatever the real reason was, Richard wasn't buying it. Richard Buckingham and Rivers dine happily together in Northampton that night. But before the dawn, Richard strikes. Rivers is detained, then Richard and Buckingham ride at breakneck speed to catch up with the king. They find him, unsurprisingly, already mounted and about to depart for London without them. Next comes one of those truly cringe-worthy moments in history. Richard and Buckingham explain to the 12-year-old boy that they've just arrested his beloved Uncle Anthony. Oh, and by the way, the rest of his Woodville relatives are up to no good as well. It didn't go down well. Whether Edward liked it or not, he was required to return to Northampton with Richard and Buckingham for, in their words, his own safety. For the next five days, Edward V, deprived of all of his Woodville relatives and advisers, was in the sole companionship of Richard and Buckingham. One can imagine all the efforts that were placed into trying to win the boy over during those five days in a Northampton Inn. Richard wasn't naturally endowed with social graces, so he must have really relied upon the flamboyant and charismatic Buckingham to try and win the boy over. And this is where our manuscript comes in. Beautiful in its simplicity and poignant in its purpose, this single piece of parchment is all that remains of Richard's efforts to gain the boy's trust. 
Across the top of the page, in oversized schoolboy handwriting, is the signature of the boy king himself. Underneath that, in his own precise penmanship, perhaps used for the first time ever by Richard, loyalty me lie, loyalty binds me, along with the signature of Richard himself, Richard Gloucester. Underlining it all in a more extemporaneous style, Cervante me Cervane, and the casual signature of the effervescent Harry Buckingham. The ultimate prize for the 15th century autograph hunter. Having seen that document, what's brought to my mind first is the issue that has plagued Richard's legacy more than any other. Would he have been able to playfully engage with Edward, even committing to the boy on paper his motto, loyalty binds me, and then murder him within just a few weeks? That possibility is chilling. And this is the scene of the alleged crime. It strikes me that there's often a factor that's overlooked in discussing Richard's complicity in the disappearance of the princes from the tower. From July 6, 1483, Richard was declared king and the boys were illegitimate. As long as they were alive, a threat did remain, but from Christmas of that year, a much greater threat existed. Her name was Elizabeth of York, the older sister of the princes. She was young, beautiful, a princess, and she was available. In France, the ambitious Henry Tudor was looking for opportunities. He declared on Christmas Day 1483 that should he seize the throne, he would marry Elizabeth, uniting the houses of York and Lancaster. In reality, marrying Elizabeth would shore up his own shaky claim to the throne. And how did Richard respond? If indeed he did murder her younger brothers, what would have stopped him from doing away with her? Or perhaps the wicked king had no stomach for follow-up murder. Then why didn't he just marry her off quickly to someone, put an end to the Tudor threat forever? On the contrary, Richard treated her with nothing but respect and dignity. The way Richard treated Elizabeth and the threat she posed is probably an indicator of how he treated her brothers. It's unlikely that Richard did murder the boys. One day we may know for sure exactly what their fate was, but one thing is for sure, even respected historians struggle to keep emotion out of their analysis of this issue. But what about the common people in Richard's day? How did they view him? I've returned to York to learn more about what Richard meant to the common man of his day. Victoria Hoyle is the city archivist for York and she's agreed to show us evidence of what ordinary people thought of Richard the man. Well, our prize item relating to Richard III is really this house book, which is one of the minute books of the city's council, the mayor and the alderman. And Inscribed into the house book is a copy of a letter that was written after Richard's death on the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. The letter doesn't look like a great deal on the page, but what it expresses is quite telling in terms of the way the city feels about Richard's death, both perhaps emotionally and personally and politically. So this is the famous uh, letter and document dating from the 23rd of August, yes. 1485, the day after the battle. The day after the battle. So the right. city, the, the alderman and the mayor have received the news that Richard has been killed mm -hmm. and they're writing a letter to uh, uh, the person they perceive to be a political ally, um, informing them of his death. And the statement that they make is quite powerful, they report that Richard has been piteously slain and murdered by the Duke of Norfolk. They use the word murdered. They use the word murdered, um, which is a very loaded term 
Absolutely. Uh, was there any risk? Are we talking treason here, possibly? Possibly, potentially. They are making quite a public statement about their feelings on the matter and about their allegiance as a city. Their relationship with Richard had been of long standing. Uh, they had been friends and hosts to him over a long period of time, from being a child up until his reign. But nevertheless, this captures the mood of the moment. Uh, it's very immediate. That the breaking news of his death. Yeah. yeah so they, they must have very recently had the message that this had happened. And um, they are responding in the moment, and you could perhaps say that that is more telling about their feelings than what they do pragmatically in the months that follow. Wow, powerful statement. Richard remains an enigma. At times somewhat dour and socially awkward, yet inspiring loyalty in those few that knew him well. A man of principle, not afraid to stand his ground and make enemies, particularly amongst the nobility, but happy to court and be loved by the common man. How to reconcile all of these contradictions? Perhaps a key to understanding Richard the man is to look more at Richard the boy. His young life was full of uncertainties, twists and turns, loss of loved ones, incarceration, escape and exile. This may well have led him as a young man to embrace the certainties of piety and duty and loyalty. Certainly any intolerance towards uncertainty would have shaped his view of fate, but also influenced his relationship with others. Also as the youngest son of a noble, Richard was earmarked for a career in the church. He was exceptionally well educated, was apparently fluent in Latin, and had a remarkable collection of books for his day. One of the most amazing items in Richard's library was this English translation of the New Testament by John Wycliffe. Although not contraband at the time, it does, however, reveal an extraordinary desire to understand the Bible, well above and beyond the call of duty for a 15th century Catholic prince. The foundation of faith and love for God that was laid when Richard was a boy was obviously still a major force in his life as a man. You can imagine all of the uncertainties of his childhood leading him to crave constancy and certainty as a man. Much is made of Richard's love of predictability, and rightly so. And loyalty, which was a major theme in his life, is one manifestation of that. But I wonder if there was another source of contradiction in the man. This is the scene of one of Richard's finest hours. The Battle of Barnard was overshadowed by treachery and betrayal. The Earl of Warwick, formerly Edward IV's greatest supporter, deserted him and joined the Lancastrian cause. Edward, along with Richard and a few other key supporters, were forced to flee the country, but they returned six months later and forced a vital battle for the crown. The battle took place right here in Barnet on April 14, 1471. The two armies lined up before dawn. Uh, Warwick took his position here, which was on higher ground, straddling the main road to London. Edward advanced under cover of darkness within just 500 metres of Warwick's position. All night long, Warwick's cannons burst out into the darkness, but he didn't realise that he was continually firing harmlessly over the heads of the Yorkist men. For the Lancastrians, Oxford held the right, Montague the centre, and Exeter had the left command. Warwick kept his forces in the rear as the reserve. For the Yorkist forces, Hastings was on the left. The king himself, Edward, commanded the centre, but Richard had the all-important right side vanguard. When dawn broke, visibility was almost nil. Darkness had been replaced by thick fog, a veritable London pea super. <laughs> 
As the armies advanced through the thick gloom, no one was yet aware of the one factor that would determine the winner. In the darkness, Edward had miscalculated Warwick's position. While he'd overlapped Warwick's position on the right, he himself had left a huge overlap of Lancastrians facing his left. Oxford's men crashed into Hastings' forces and the Yorkist left was smashed. The Lancastrians, riding high on their easy victory, descended into a triumphant frenzy and ran onto Barnet to loot the town. However, things were going very differently on the other side of the battle. Richard probably had the hardest terrain of all the commanders to negotiate at Barnet. In the mist, he advanced his men down a very steep slope and into a swampy marsh. Realising he'd just gone right past the side of the battle, he rallied his men, brought them back up the steep slope, and they crashed over the plateau into Exeter's men. The Lancastrians wheeled back in shock, and the whole battle started to shift on its axis. Exeter's line was in disarray, and he signalled for help. Warwick, imagining that Edward was throwing the bulk of his force in a surprise outflanking manoeuvre, committed most of his reserve to bolster Exeter and fight Richard. This was the crucial point of the battle. Exeter, with fresh troops, now started to push the outnumbered Richard toward the precipice, toward the slope and the fatal trap of the marsh. Paul Murray Kendall, in his groundbreaking biography of Richard, dramatically describes the scene in the Yorkist ranks at this point. Edward sensed that victory depended upon his reserve, which he had grimly husbanded even after the collapse of his left. If his brother Richard could hold out, messengers came and went through the mist. The answer was always the same. Richard would hold without reinforcements. Then the turning point came. Oxford finally regrouped his men, pulling them away from their looting of Barnet. He advanced them back up the road and crashed into Edward's rear. Except it wasn't Edward's army. Oxford and his men had no idea that the battle had swung 90 degrees to a north-south axis. So when they finally returned to the battle, still enshrouded in mist, it was their allies, Montague's men, that they encountered. Montague's men thought they were enemy and unleashed arrows at them. Oxford's men recoiled in shock, and the dreaded word sounded out, treason. The word spread through the loose Lancastrian alliance, and panic spread with it. Men started to flee the battle, and the day was lost for Warwick. Richard's fame as a general was forged that day. When he outflanked his enemy, he was able to control his troops and return them to the battle. When he engaged Exeter and felt the full force of Warwick's reserves, he was able to marshal his troops and hold them rock solid, unmovable with their backs to the edge of the slope. Mike Narona is a trustee at the Barnet Museum. He's an expert on Barnet and is happy to expand my understanding of the battle. What, what sort of things would Richard have experienced during the thick of the battle? What, uh, I guess we're looking at the the actual dynamics of a medieval battle at that stage. What, what things would he have experienced? Oh, I, I would have thought it would be terrifying. Um, they, the, the nobles would have had the armour and everything which would have protected them slightly more, but it would have actually made them stand out as well. So there would have been, there would have been targets um, as well. Um, Barnum was also fought in a very heavy um, fog which meant that you um, know very little time to think, um, and if you're a medieval general, part of the job is you're actually having to rally your troops at the same time as fight. Um, you have to you have to think your tactics as well as is um, in the short term as well as make sure someone's not bashing you over the head with a, a mace. So I would have thought it was a terrifying ordeal, um, and we hear about. Uh, Richard not being that strong, you mean a hunchback or that, whatever, you know, to be in the middle of a medieval battle, you'd have to be in pretty, 
pretty fit and pretty uh, pretty attached. In more recent times, Mike, we've had um, examples of even very highly trained soldiers returning from places like Vietnam, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, and despite their training, they suffer horrendously with stress disorders. Is there any evidence that men suffered similar things in medieval times from medieval warfare? When you look at it back, looking back to it, to come to the um the lens of history, um, it would seem that they must have had something. Uh, they must have must have suffered. It'd be very odd for them not to have. Um, whether they got the sympathy that they get nowadays, I think is highly unlikely. Henry the Sixth um, suffered from catatonic fits, and uh, when he, when he froze, the country went went to the regents, the argument started, yeah. so it was seen as a sign of weakness. I don't think you had a lot of sympathy with um, uh, stress-related illnesses. Barnet was an extraordinary victory for the Yorkist cause and Richard was the find of the battle. Of course, just three weeks later, Tewkesbury took place and Richard was once again in the fray, leading the Yorkist vanguard, this time on the left. But it was Barnet that forged his reputation. He was now known as a fearsome warrior and the foremost general in the kingdom. He was just 18 years old. So who exactly was Richard III? Well, dare I quote Shakespeare at this stage? That is the question. It seems to me on my own brief journey that there's, there was more than one Richard. There was the quiet man with very deep thoughts and probably very deep feelings as well. But on the other hand, there was the warrior who led his men into battle and spilled much blood. There was the man of empathy who loved justice and sought it at every occasion for his fellow man. But then there was the man who knew how to take very tough decisions to get things done. There was the man who had a love of God and a faith in God, and yet he was also a man who knew how to cut you down in an instant if he thought it was for the greater good. It seems to me that Richard was neither one nor the other, but the unhealthy or, or uneasy convergence of both personalities, both Richards, perhaps uneasy within himself of what he'd had to become. Richard may also have had a lot of his father in him. The old Duke at times seemed uncertain. He could be awkward and even politically naive. Was this an inherited trait that Richard bore? The fidgety mannerism recorded on the famous portrait might actually be a real living memory of Richard by the artist. So why is it that Richard means so much to people today? He died over 500 years ago, reigned for only two years, and left no lasting dynasty. Perhaps it's the momentary flashes of humanity and justice that we see shining through in his very brief reign. Where would he have taken the kingdom if he'd been allowed to develop his vision? We think of the potential, the lost potential, the things that could have been. He's kind of like the medieval James Dean. Also there's the life experience that we share with him. Love, family, simple pleasures, but on the other hand, betrayal, loss, and finally death. Richard's life is a representation of the entire human experience, boiled down to a specimen of just 32 years. It's taken me nearly 30 years to put my finger on exactly what it is that draws me to Richard. The Bible coins a term quite frequently, loyal love. That's the term that describes the relationship between Ruth and Naomi, or David and Jonathan, or even God and humans. Loyal love is the thought of attaching yourself loyally to a person, but also taking positive action to benefit that person. It's very rare in this world, but that is what Richard had. He lovingly attached himself to his brother Edward, regardless of the cost. He wasn't a yes man, but he devoted his life to the benefit of his brother. Sadly for Richard, when Edward died, 
he lost the focal point of his life. And so that's our Richard. Flawed perhaps, but certainly a man of integrity. A man who stood by his principles. His tragic story touches something in us even today. We can feel his loss, his anguish and his uncertainties. Of all the monarchs who've ever reigned, who've emphasised their majesty and superiority and glory over the common man, it's Richard whose humanity comes to the fore. And in that he remains one shining example. Love him or hate him, he remains one of the greatest characters of all time.